Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am coordinator for the EBM Tools Network and uh, editor of the Skimmer on Marine Ecosystems and Management, um, which are both services of Octo. Um, and I am moderating today's webinar on behalf of the NOAA National MPA Center. Uh, we are very pleased to be, welcome here um, John Bohorkas who, from Stony Brook University, who's gonna be speaking about developing a financial sustainability assessment tool for marine protected areas. Uh, in just a second, I'll turn it over to Johnny, but I wanted to let you know uh, the basic format is that Johnny will be presenting and then we'll have ample time for Q&A at the end of the webinar. Uh, you can send questions in both through the chat functionality as well as through the questions. Um, through the chat, you have the options of making anything you send in visible to just the panelists or to the panelists and the whole um, audience. Um, you're welcome to send in comments and um, information that is uh, pertinent to the topic, uh, but we ask that you be respectful um, in doing so if you're gonna send everything to the whole audience. Um, so if there's any quick clarifying questions, I can ask Johnny during the presentation, but otherwise we'll hold the questions till the end of, of his presentation. Okay, well, uh, thank you. Thank you, John, uh, for being here um, and I'll turn it over to you. Great, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for, for listening in. I'm excited to present today on, on my dissertation research on financial sustainability for marine protected areas. Just to preface, this is an ongoing research project, so I can't share every bit of information. Some things will remain confidential until publication, uh, but I think you'll find it very insightful. Um, first, I'd like to just discuss a little bit about uh, some of my background and, and how I came into this topic of marine protected area finance. Um, so before starting grad school at Stony Brook, uh, my education and working background was primarily in finance and economics. I graduated from Bowdoin College with a degree in economics and environmental studies, uh, and then worked in private equity, investing in the com commercial real estate and renewable energy space. Uh, I arrived to Stony Brook uh, in the PhD program with the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences and the Institute for Ocean Conservation Science, or IOCS in the fall of 2015, where I've been advised by Dr. Ellen Pekic and Dr. Anthony Dabarskis. I'm also a, uh, for the last year and a half, I've been a technical specialist with the Conservation Finance Alliance or CFA, which is a WCS hosted uh, NGO that among a number of research projects, uh, we're also developing an investment plan for the Global Fund for Coral Reefs and also have a marine and coastal finance working group. So our lab at Stony Brook IOCS in partnership with organizations like the Ocean Sanctuary Alliance has a long history of scientific research and policy action related to MPAs from the international policy level down to site level planning enforcement and scientific monitoring. Still, when I arrived at the program, I wouldn't have guessed that MPA finance would end up being the focus of my dissertation. And that's probably because I was unaware at the time of just how important it was. Um, but my eyes were open when one of my first tasks at IOCS was to help conduct background research for a meeting my advisor was helping put together in Italy in March of 2016, titled Marine Protected Areas and Urgent Imperative. John, uh, yes. we'll slow down just a hair. Oh, I'm sorry about that, sure. Yeah. Um, so I was surprised to, to learn in doing the background research for this meeting that, that MPA finance was one of three uh, topical areas that would become the focus of a scientific consensus, consensus statement around MPAs that would then influence a diplomatic call to action. Um, and through this initial work, I learned about how of the thousands of MPAs around the world, experts have long feared that as many as two thirds or more may fall short of conservation goals, often due to a lack of enforcement and adequate financial resources. And more recent published research would further describe how these shortfalls are so often rooted in the lack of staff capacity. So I saw that this area of MPA finance was crucial to the future of marine conservation as we work towards protecting 10% and potentially 30% of the ocean. And that it was also something that considering my background, I was in a unique position to address. Uh, I've also observed that while there are a lot of practical tools for MPA management and marine spatial planning and a lot of information on conservation finance in general, there is relatively little practical guidance for specifically MPA finance. So for my dissertation research, I decided to focus on developing a financial sustainability assessment tool for MPAs that MPA managers could use to evaluate the, uh, the, the viability and the, long, and the longevity of their in place, uh, of their financial strategies um, oriented around three main questions. First, 
is your MPA's financial strategy at risk of not being able to meet needs? Uh, which might include, a set, you know, is, is there a funding gap? Do more funds need to be raised? But also even for areas that have enough funds presently, might there be some underlying risks or weaknesses that might undermine uh, sustainability in the future? Furthermore, rolling that into the second question, what might be some potential actions to improve financial sustainability, including potentially making more uh, effective or impactful use of in-place resources, uh, strengthening and potentially expanding upon existing financial mechanisms uh, or identifying and implementing alternative financial mechanisms. And another research question, the third question here that we're very interested to explore is, is to the extent that some financial mechanisms and strategies might be dependent on certain environmental characteristics, how might long-term changes in the local environment, including from impacts from climate change, potentially undermine or otherwise impact uh, financial sustainability for some MPAs over the long term? So we've published a bit of research that has helped uh, really uh, frame our approach to developing a sustainable financing assessment tool. Uh, the first of which was published in February of 2019, where we directly compared uh, the differences in cost and finance for marine versus terrestrial protected areas. And one of the uh, findings from that was that while all protected areas to a degree, of course, rely on and require long-term operating costs, those long-term operating costs were particularly significant for uh, marine protected areas in particular and helping to cement our kind of long-term perspective here uh, for financial sustainability. And furthermore, that there was very uh, little public information for us to really go on and to analyze um, for, for uh, relevance at the, at the site level. And so if we were really going to make uh, meaningful progress in this field, a, uh, a case study approach would, would be required. So part of that case study approach, we, we've always wanted this, this financing tool to be relevant on a global scale. And so then logically it would make sense to help uh, to try as, as, as much as possible to have our select case studies be representative of the diversity of MPAs around the world as a whole. Uh, so we performed a uh, statistical analysis where we uh, defined MPAs in the seven main categories on a global scale from which would uh, help guide our case study selection. And we've since collected seven case studies, which for logistical reasons are uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, including four in Colombia that we've already uh, finished co uh, data collection for, two in the Caribbean, uh, Corales de Profundidad and Corales de Rosario, which are both near uh, Cartagena, uh, as well as two in the Pacific, including the Malpella Marine, Marine Sanctuary and Gorgona National Park, which are both IUCN Green List MPAs. All four of these MPAs are in uh, Colombia's national park system. The fifth MPA uh, is the Bonaire National Marine Park, which is the first financially self-sustaining MPA in the Caribbean. And we have two that data collection uh, was delayed uh, for because of uh, COVID related reasons and travel restrictions, but we're uh, currently uh, collecting the, the data remotely. Uh, for a manatee sanctuary in uh, Mexico and in nearby uh, the Corozal Bay Wildlife Sanctuary in Belize, which provide a very interesting comparison uh, across international borders. Now, I'd love to go into each of these case studies individually and help describe some of the, uh, the, the diversity of, of the characteristics and how we see these through a financial lens. Uh, I don't have time to go into all of them, but I'll talk about the two that I think represent two major extremes here. Uh, and they coincidentally happen to be direct neighbors. So starting with Corrales de Rosario in Colombia, this is an older MPA. Um, it was established in 1977. It has a lot of the ecosystems you'd expect in a, a marine national park in the Caribbean, including uh, coral reefs, sea grass beds, mangroves, coastal lagoons. It's also the most highly visited uh, protected area in all of Colombia, receiving about one to two million visitors per year. And through its entry fee system is the second highest earning protected area in Colombia. The funds going to the, the Ministry of the Environment. Um, but it's an example of an NPA that produces a, a high amount of income, has a fairly high budget that supports about 50 employees. Uh, but as far as environmental quality, may be on the, the lower end of the, the spectrum compared to its, uh, its peers. Only 12 kilometers to the west is um, Corrales de Profundidad, 
and this area could not be more different. This MPA was just recently established in 2013, really didn't come up to full scale operations until the last couple of years. Um, and the shallowest point in this MPA is about 36 meters deep um, in the seamount in the northeastern quadrant. But the MPA is 100% marine, and its primary uh, objective is, is the conservation of deep sea corals. Um, this MPA has no tourism component, um, doesn't generate any income from the Ministry of the Environment, and it has a comparatively small staff uh, at only six staff members, all of whom are uh, contracted staff on, on 11 month contracts and it does not have its own uh, manager either. So what are the working pieces here uh, for this research as it relates to eventually developing the financial sustainability assessment tool? So we have the case studies, we have the case study data collection. We're also doing a desktop study or a literature review of, of financial mechanisms that can be used to, to support MPAs over the long term and looking at indicators for success or enabling conditions that based on the context of the MPA, um, what, how, where might they succeed or fail for different MPAs uh, considering the local context. And, and by combining these two approaches, we are uh, conducting a series of comprehensive financial sustainability analyses, analyses independently for each of these seven case studies. The eventual financing tool will um, be kind of a reflection of our experience of conducting these case studies and guide users through the same steps that we did in analyzing these sites, as well as providing all of the case study findings and outputs as, as, a, as a, an important reference guide. So the information available, of course, differs from MPA to MPA, and we embrace that because we want this to be as uh, usable as possible in a wide diversity of scenarios, regardless of how much uh, information an MPA may have um, to go with. But there are generally four types of information that we've looked to, to our best ability, try to secure for each of our case studies. And that includes first, the, the most recent management plan and other reports published by the managing agency, uh, the financial records, including historical income and expenses whenever available. Um, we had a survey that we've disseminated in addition to uh, organizing semi-structured interviews with uh, local stakeholders mostly employees of the MPAs, but whenever possible, we extend that to, for example, uh, representatives of local fishery cooperatives, local business owners and tour operators, things like that. Um, and we also look to, to uh, find other relevant published research, especially impact assessments and economic related research that helps us better define uh, the beneficiaries and the pressures and the value flows associated with the ecosystems in each area. So even though on the fine scales, the analyses may differ slightly from MPA to MPA, they all run through the same basic five-step process, uh, the same five-step process that will be reflected in the eventual financial sustainability assessment tool. The first is looking at the background of the MPA and trying to establish uh, how finance is really relevant. And for that, the first thing that I always like to do is just get a, a handle on, on the overall financial structure for an MPA. Uh, this being a visualization for the financial structure of, of uh, the Bonaire National Marine Park, for which uh, over 90% of the uh, the income has usually come from from their tourism and their tourist entry fee program for about the last 20 years. Um, we we consider this a closed loop financial structure because some of the ecosystem services provided, uh, in this case, to recreational benefits, are returned to the park management uh, through the tourism fee structure. But it shows uh, some of the general important relationships and, and uh, organizations to, to consider uh, when evaluating the financing for this park. So then we look to kind of do a top-down approach of how the park is overall doing and how finance might relate to the success of this area. Uh, so from our surveys, we've observed that Bonaire is performing generally fair to good. Um, and even though the environmental quality is high, especially compared to some neighboring areas, uh, the environment has overall degraded uh, from prior decades. And, and the main driver of degradation, especially currently, has been considered to be a, a development of, of the island, including population growth. The permanent population has, I think, more or less doubled over the last 10 years, um, as well as uh, growth in the tourism sector, cruise tourism in particular has increased, I think around five to tenfold over the last 10 years as well. 
Um, there's some illegal fishing, though that has been, you know, that's which is still significant. Um, but again, primarily the 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 pressure is from development on the island, even on the eastern side of the island, which is uh, more rural. There has even been plans and negotiations for thousand unit condo developments, things like that. Uh, now, how financial sustainability is is related? Of course, uh, we we look at direct relations or impacts and indirect relations or impacts. Uh, how might finance be directly related to the effectiveness of an MPA? It could be that there are insufficient funds for operations, uh, for required operations. In Glenair, there may be uh, some perhaps additional funds may be required for, for enforcement on the area, especially as, as the population grows on the island um, and the number of visitors increase as well. Um, as far as indirect impacts, we consider these kind of underlying issues that may not have a visual uh, visible effect right now on the parks uh, um, effectiveness, uh, but could over time. And, and for Bonaire, that includes a rise in costs from increasing tourists, especially less experienced tourists coming from the, the cruise ships who are exempt from paying the entry fee actually. Um, and also a, a lack of diversity of funding sources. This park has fully relied, almost fully relied on tourism. And of course with COVID-19 right now and with travel restrictions, th this has devastated a lot of parks a lot of MPAs around the world um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, it leaves uh, particularly ones depending on tourism exposed to potential losses in income. And, and with that, I will say that because we collected data for Bonaire and the parks in Colombia before COVID, that's really where the majority of the perspective for analyzing these is for right now. So I just wanna um, state that early on in the presentation. Uh, the next step is to get a little bit more hands-on with the actual finances. So we look to start analyzing the budget and I can't show, this is for Corrales de Profundidad, I can't show what the actual budget is uh, for, confidenti for confidentiality at this early stage, but I can show how it's more or less uh, been distributed across different uses over time. Uh, again, this is, this is an MPA that was just established in 2013. It's slowly scaled up operations. Um, until about 2016, 2017, it really it received its first uh, patrol vessel, and 2018 was the first year of that patrol of in full use of that patrol vessel. So it's really probably the most uh, likely to be reflective of what long-term budgeting and operations might look like for this MPA. And what we've seen is that 59% of the budget has gone to uh, personnel costs, 33% to equipment and fuel. 5% to uh, facilities, so that includes rent and uh, utilities. The park doesn't actually have a scientific monitoring budget, although it has received uh, outside support through monitoring efforts from local oceanographic institutions. Uh, and it has a very, very small outreach and education budget, uh, which is small enough that it's, it's above zero, but it rounds down to zero on this, on this table. Uh, and the remaining 3% goes to things like office supplies and travel. So this is an example of uh, an MPA that's working with a very, very minimal budget uh, that really doesn't have much use, doesn't have much uh, funds to, to use beyond this very, very basic needs for, for personnel and equipment and fuel. Um, so next is once we've seen how the budget is really, how current financial resources are used, we next try to estimate if there is a financial gap, if there is a funding gap, what are the priority areas for additional funding? Uh, and for this, we kind of have uh, three different types of tools that we can use. First is, is the, the results from our surveys and interviews, which include uh, budget specific questions, um, internal evaluations as well, uh, which for Corrales de Profundidad, we have two. One is the IMAPS analysis, which is a, a, a standard evaluation that each national park in Colombia is required to do every uh, few years, which is uh, an evaluation for you know, progress towards conservation goals and capacity shortfalls done at the, the site level. So between the, the sites management and staff. Um, and we also have a 2018 evaluation that was done by the central office, the central administrative office in Bogota, on the funding gap for this specific park, uh, which is a unique opportunity to look at how funding priorities may compare between site level management and operations and, uh, and national administration. And third, we also have independent costing models so that we can look to compare what projected outputs might be versus what we actually see in reality. So for the, the, the stakeholder surveys and interviews, the survey results, there was almost unanimous, um, unanimous perspective that, that uh, 
the budget for personnel was below or well below uh, needs for effective enforcement and management. And particular concerns there for Conales de Profundidad were that they didn't have a full-time manager to quote one respondent. They, there's no, they don't have a manager that they can count on 24 seven because they share the same manager as neighboring Corales de Rosarios where the manager really dedicates most of their time. And furthermore, there may be some issues with, with the, the prevalence of contracted staff, which being on 11 month contracts, there are sometimes periods of a month or more when key positions just aren't being filled. Um, furthermore, the IMS report determined that, uh, concluded that for only 43% of required staff capacity was uh, being met. <clears throat> but interestingly enough, the, the, the national administration uh, and central offices fi funding financial gap analysis did, a, did a report a funding gap, but didn't actually, in, in meeting that gap, didn't really allocate much of any additional resources for personnel. So there is a, uh, it demonstrates that there, there are different priorities potentially between uh, the site level and, and national level management that could potentially be a problem. Um, furthermore, uh, this, the, the, uh, the parks management was able to conduct 27 on-site patrols in 2018. That figure was limited uh, by the fuel budget. And so there's, there's, uh, definitely, um, a need potentially for, 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 um, additional funding towards equipment and fuel. As far as the independent model results, um, I would say as an, as an immediate caveat, the, the few models that are available for projecting likely costs of an MPA are few and far between. These are the two that we've found are, are really the most usable. They're still used for costing studies today, even though they may potentially be a little bit dated. Um, and another caveat is that they were really designed for costing network level costs, uh, not really site level. But nonetheless, it's interesting just to just to experiment here and, and see where the projections lie compared to reality. So for the Balanford model from 2004, which is based on area, distance from shore and purchasing power parity, the model projected that operational costs for Corrales de Profundidad would be 11 times more than what the actual uh, 2018 budget was. Uh, for Gravestock, uh, that model looked at uh, area and number of visitors to project minimum funding requirements, which it determined were about 80% greater or 1.8 times that of the, the 2018 budget. So a little bit closer to what was actually spent. Um, and, and the budget was still within the, the lower bound of the standard deviation, but overall these, these costing models tend to suggest that expected funds or needed funds are, are substantially higher than what uh, the park was actually afforded. So we also conduct, we also uh, compiled our own budget. I can't, I can't show the details yet at this early stage um, for what we think line by line could be basic needs. Um, and, and we concluded that the, this park likely has, needs to increase its budget well over hundred percent, which we uh, classified as a severe funding gap uh, and with a priority on, on increasing costs for, for personnel, particularly get, getting a full-time manager. Um, equipment, and, equipment and fuel, as well as education and outreach. Um, and scientific monitoring, which we only uh, classify as a level, at a lower level of priority, only because there is some scientific monitoring done supported by, uh, supported by local institutions. <clears throat> We also look to assess how efficiently and impactfully resources, current resources are being used and if this could be improved upon. We start by looking at how much of the budget is spent on personnel, which is perhaps the most important cost to pay attention to. Not only has research demonstrated that staff capacity is the greatest indicator of MPA success, but some MPA managers in financial planning have actually aimed to allocate a specific percentage of their annual budget to personnel year to year. Uh, experts we've consulted with have generally agreed that most MPA should allocate about 60 to 70 percent of their budget for personnel. Um, in, in 2018, Corrales de Profundidad allocated 59 percent of its budget to personnel, which is a little bit lower than we might like to see. However, the ideal ratio is always context dependent. Um, and because Corrales de Profundidad is a little bit more of a remote area that may require you know, a more expensive vessel and more fuel to patrol, uh, that ratio may be a little bit lower. So overall, we saw 59% as a, as a reasonable number. Um, but if it were much below this, certainly say 50%, around 50% or lower, we might recommend that the MPA reallocate some of its funds from other areas in the budget back towards personnel. Uh, we also look at the quality of relationships with local stakeholders as a way of potentially decreasing the funding gap if relations can be improved upon that being under, under the logic that more positive relations may decrease the number of violators and subsequently resources required for enforcement. 
Uh, and in some particularly positive cases, some stakeholders may even be encouraged to assist in management and help share some of the costs or offload some of the costs of, of the MPA. Um, we also evaluate the quality of collaboration and communication with groups like the Navy, the Coast Guard, et cetera, under the logic that more cohesive collaboration leads to more efficient uses of resources across all enforcement agencies when they actually, when they operate really more as a team versus when they operate uh, entirely independently. Uh, for Corrales de Profundidad, we found that these relations were generally positive already, and there might be some limited opportunities for improvement, but overall, uh, such opportunities would likely be uh, comparatively insignificant to in, in light of the scale of the finance gap and substantially more funds are likely needed for this MPA regardless. So with that in mind, the, the next step is analyzing the income of the MPAs and the current financial mechanisms. And just to give you a flavor of what we, we have so far, uh, here are some examples of some of the financial mechanisms that our, our case studies have already employed. Uh, of course, traditional mechanisms like annual government budgets, uh, grants from outside organizations, four have tourism entry and activity fees. Some have uh, concession, concession agreements with tourism operators. Uh, some uh, gain income from, from research fees or, or permits for, for filming. Uh, and one case also has uh, an, its own exclusive endowment fund, which was capitalized both by uh, a philanthropic grant as well as uh, leftover capital from, from a previous death for nature swap. An example being uh, the Malpelo Marine Sanctuary, which has is uh, Malpelo is, is a co-managed area, co-managed by two NGOs and the National Parks Program. Uh, one of those NGOs being the Fundación Malpelo or Malpelo Foundation, which receives uh, an annual budget from the Fondo Patrimonial or basically an endowment fund for the park. Uh, and I like to, and so what we do is for each of these financial mechanisms, including this one, is we, we look to, at the, the historical disbursements over time to see how reliable has this financial mechanism really been. And I think this is an interesting case because conservation trust funds like this are often looked at and deservedly so for, for being great for, for ensuring uh, consistent support over time. Still, they're not immune to potential uh, unexpected cuts in funding, this being no exception. Uh, and, there, and this park did receive um, uh, a cut in the, in the disbursements from the fund around 2012, uh, due in part to uh, perhaps poor fund management. The original uh, fund managers were actually has since been fired and replaced, uh, but also due to uh, macroeconomic factors that are, are sometimes outside of the control of fund management, in this case being uh, one of the, the factors here was has been volatility in, in the currency exchange rates. So what's important to remember is that while from the site level management perspective, the funds are coming in as Colombian pesos, the fund itself as an international fund is managed in dollars and the disbursements are originally budgeted in dollars. Uh, and the Colombian pesos strengthened a lot against the US dollar from 2009 to, to 2012. So to meet the need in pesos, they actually had to go over budget in their annual disbursements uh, by about 10 to 15%. Uh, for a few years running there. Um, and then from 2012 to 2019, the opposite happened. The peso weakened substantially against the dollar. And that's actually been beneficial for the funds management because they've been able to provide the, you know, the required amount in pesos, but at a discount to the US dollar. Uh, so this is just an example of how when we look at the, the historical volatility and reliability of, of in-place financial mechanisms, we can begin to identify potential issues, potential risks uh, to consider going forward. And, and this also being an example that while co conservation trust funds can be great and very reliable, they are not, they're not invincible. Next, after looking at the historical reliability of the in-place financial mechanisms, we also look at what are the opportunities to potentially improve or expand income, uh, the income from uh, the in-place financial mechanisms. So not to go into any one uh, example here, but as I said, several of our case studies have a user fee system. And we've, and we've observed a few areas for potential improvement here. Some sites have uh, difficulties with compliance. For example, Corales de Rosarios has, uh, they, they estimate that less than 30, there's a less than 30% compliance with the fee. Uh, some haven't conducted, several haven't conducted willingness to pay studies at any point in the history of the fee to uh, help, which can help better ascertain, is this really the, the ideal fee? Can the fee be raised? How much? Uh, willingness to pay studies can also help understand, you know, should you set a, a separate fee for international visitors or for scuba divers versus snorkelers? Um, which leads into diversifying fees. Uh, for example, 
some parks have everyone pays the same regardless of what you're doing and uh, or your demographics, but some um, MPAs have been able to get additional income by staggering fees, depending on whether you're a domestic or international visitor, if you're a student, if you're a senior, so on and so forth. Um, and there's also in some cases on air the opportunity to potentially expand fees to, to other, other groups that are currently aren't paying. Uh, Bonaire, as I said before, the, the non-dive tag at Bonaire is um, cruise ship passengers are exempt from paying that. And as just as an estimation of scale here, if Bonaire had 100% compliance with its non-dive tag, which right now extends only perhaps around 50%, and if a very conservative one in 20 cruise ship passengers paid the, the nature fee, that could potentially increase their income by, we estimate around 65% uh, compared to 2018, um, which achieving that is easier said than done, but it, it provides a, uh, a sense of scale here on the range for potential improvements and expansion upon these in-place mechanisms. So the last step and perhaps the most important, uh, especially for areas that have uh, you know, relied exclusively on, on one source of financing and in particular tourism is, is what are the potential alternative mechanisms that can be employed here um, to raise additional funds? So first, before going into this, it's, I want to just uh, kind of describe what we consider a financial mechanism, which we describe as, as the pairing of a source of funding, which can be like uh, the government, an NGO, um, tourists, things like that. Uh, the pairing of a source with an instrument, the instrument is essentially being the tool that leverages funds from that source and provides it to the MPA. So an instrument could be like a user fee or a grant. In this example for blue carbon, the source would be a donor or a polluter of greenhouse gas emissions that depending on if it's a voluntary or involuntary structure um, would deliver the fees using the instrument being uh, the carbon offset program to the MPA, which then combined with how you budget and use those funds uh, constructs the overall financial strategy. So you have about 15 sources and about 15 instruments that we're evaluating and identifying indicators for success. So that can be uh, environmental conditions, level of socioeconomic development, uh, management practices that may um, it indicates potential pitfalls or strengths of certain financial mechanisms for certain MPAs, depending on the context. And we try to make these as, as straightforward as possible. So for example, for blue carbon, the presence of uh, carbon sequestering ecosystems like mangroves would be a positive indicator um, for tourism or for international donations, the presence of charismatic megafauna or a flagship species can be important uh, for some uh, international multilateral groups. There might be uh, requirements considering the, the, the economic context, the socioeconomic development of an area. So just a few examples there. Uh, this framework is still in development, so I can't show any specific examples for any of our case study sites so far. Um, but another way that we can also begin to ascertain potential alternative financial mechanisms is, is through the, the polluter pays or the user pays principle where we identify the beneficiaries and the main threats on the MPAs and try to engineer uh, financial mechanisms around those relationships. Uh, so this is a, an example for Corales de Profundidad in Colombia. I think the potential for this area for alternative financial mechanisms is really rooted in what the primary pressures are on this region, um, which is really the oil industry, both for shipping and transport, as well as, uh, as um, uh, uh, exploration and exploitation. This map here is showing the the uh, the seabed areas that have where private contracts have been granted to both international and domestic oil companies off of Colombia's Caribbean. Some of which directly flank uh, this MPA to the north and to the west. Uh, so some some potential mechanisms that could leverage funds from uh, this industry could include uh, biodiversity offsets which I think is particularly exciting um, in light in part because the, uh, the recent finance for nature report by the Paulson Institute and the Nature Conservancy um, projected that, that annual, uh, annual revenue leveraged by biodiversity offsets could increase by 20 times uh, by the year 2030. Furthermore, you could also have uh, earmarked taxes on uh, oil on fossil fuel products or fees and charges uh, for docking or mooring in the area. Uh, or you could even try to leverage uh, philanthropic grants from, from the, the prominent uh, domestic and international oil companies that are active in this area. Now the primary threat to the biodiversity within this marine protected area. So the last step here is 
based on the previous steps, what are the recommendations for each of these areas? What, what could they possibly uh, do? And we expect to provide kind of three levels of recommendations, which are based on steps two through four of the analysis and are also in order of kind of easiest and most feasible to most challenging. The easiest and most feasible is, is being, how can you make the most impactful use of the resources that you already have? Um, the second being, how can you expand upon, how can you expand upon or fortify mechanisms that are already in, in place to improve the sustainability of your financial strategy? And the third being, what are those potential alternative mechanisms that you could uh, investigate for potential implementation? As far as the general, as far as the general research outcomes, we, we expect to provide a, a suite of catered recommendations for each of the case study sites that have uh, graciously participated in this research. Uh, we expect to provide a wealth of general insight and observations and findings on MPA finance and management, including on specific financial mechanisms. And most importantly, um, a number of lessons that can be applied elsewhere through our replicable MPA finance tool. And the next steps as far as developing that tool, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done between now and when we expect to, to deliver a first draft, which is around my, my, my uh, prospective graduation date in uh, June of next year. Uh, including finishing data collection for the remaining sites, uh, finalizing the, the mechanism evaluation framework and uh, completing the evaluation for each of the case study sites. We also have some long-term goals to potentially develop the tool into, potential, into possibly a web platform as well as test the tool by returning it to some of the MPAs that have participated or new MPAs to test it uh, to see if the, the managers can uh, effectively use this and if they come to the same conclusions that we did about the areas. Um, and as, as many areas have been so terribly impacted by, by the impacts of, of the, the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, this research having been done, a lot of the data collection done immediately preceding could be very important for an eventual kind of post COVID, uh, 19 analysis by having a, a data set that reflects the, the state of these MPAs immediately preceding this, this global event. So with that, I'd, I'd like to thank the numerous individuals and organizations that have supported this work so far, uh, Pamela and John Frederick Tia at the Institute for Ocean Conservation Science, uh, the Ocean Sanctuary Alliance, my advisors and committee members, Ellen, Anthony, Dr. Janet Nye, Rashid Samila, and Jennifer Jaquette. Uh, thank you as well to the Open Channels and Opto platform for hosting this along with the uh, National MPA Center. And a very big thank you as well to the many organizations uh, affiliated with some of these case studies that, that have, uh, that their, their, their participation um, was, has been fantastic. So thank you there. And with that, I'll, here's my contact information um, and various affiliations. Please reach out to me through any of these, these, uh, these lines and I'll open the floor for, for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Johnny. Um, Okay, and I wanted to let everyone know you can go ahead and send in questions through the chat or the Q&A now. Uh, we already have quite a few uh, that we'll start uh, tackling. Okay, so let's see, John, a question that came in, are any of your case uh, cases, case MPAs fully protected MPAs, um, AKA no take MPAs? Do you have any data that could compare the financial sustainability of fully protected areas with other types of MPAs? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, two of them are uh, Malpelo and Gorgona are both fully protected. As far as comparing the data, they're very different contexts. So, you know, do we have enough of a data set to, to look at how the costs necessarily differ? Um, but certainly on, on the financing side, any potential financial mechanisms that might relate to fishery activity, right? Um, you know, access fees, permanent access fees, where that's possible uh, would be limited within the boundaries of the actual area. Um, so that's, that's some potential differences there. Uh, but again, this is, we're still in the, in the early stages that it's, it's a little bit, uh, soon for me to comment on that specifically, but I hope that, that helps answer the question partially. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a question about Bonaire, uh, why are cruise ships exempt from entry or use fees? Uh, that seems like a big mistake on the part of the government. Uh, the, the original agreement was that Bonaire, the, the, the head tax on cruise ship passengers is about 350 per person, which is unfortunately some of the lowest in the Caribbean. Um, the park was initially supposed to receive, Sinapa, the NGO that manages the MPA, was originally supposed to receive about a third of that income, um, but that, that didn't end up happening either. So that's, that's, a, that's a political issue. 
uh, with regards to to how they've organized uh, where the tax revenue from from the uh, the the cruise passengers have gone. Okay, um, there was a question in, um, about what percentage of, of the MPA revenues are predictable, and what has what have I guess what percentage has to be raised on an annual basis. Um, sorry, can you say that again? Uh, what percentage of the MPA's revenues are predictable, and what percentage has to be raised on an annual basis? Um, I guess so. On on predictable. I guess it would it would determine on whatever is is supporting the MPA, right? If it's coming from a trust where there's a long term kind of agreement that they're going to more or less receive a certain amount every year, um, how much do you need to raise on an annual basis? I mean, ideally you, you raise enough to meet your full needs, um, but for some areas, so for example, uh, Bonaire, they're able to maintain control of the funds that they do raise. Uh, they manage that internally, and they've been able to to okay. uh, they've been able to essentially save up a rainy day fund. So that's an example of where, depending on the management structure and the governance around the area, sometimes it's just raising the funds for that year. Sometimes it's perhaps trying to raise a little bit more, um, depending on on your ability to use those funds. Okay, thank you, John. Um, question. Aren't MPA costs related to specific objectives and to levels of compliance with regulations, which in turn can be related at least in part to whether an MPA is created as a top-down or a bottom-up initiative? If so, it seems like generalized models to calculate enforcement and surveillance costs may not be all that helpful to determine funding gaps. So as I said during the, uh, during the presentation, that's, we want to try to include some degree of uh, outside independent perspective here. Um, I did introduce those with the caveat that those were actually, those were really designed for projecting a range of costs for at minimum at, at a network level. Um, so we don't take those as gospel. It's still, it's, it's still something that, of course, everything is context dependent. That's why we go into the, the specific details of certain line items and compare those against needs uh, from the ground up as well. Um, so we, we certainly don't take those as the, 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 the linear model outputs is gospel, uh, but there, it's more of just something that we're, we're experimenting with. Um, and, and as we continue to do, to do that for a, a greater set beyond the couple that we've been able to do it for, hopefully that, that might lend insight, not just on, on potential funding gaps, but on the potential, you know, the workability of these models themselves. Okay, thank you, John. Let's see, another question that came in, can you speak to how important our influential governance structures are re relative to the success of MPAs and leveraging finance solutions to support MPA management? Uh, the person is particularly interested in evidence around sites managed by indigenous peoples and local communities. Mm -hmm. I think one of the <laughs> most important things from a government framework is, is the extent that, that MPAs have the the legal ability to seek out their own funding. Uh, some government structures will restrict any funding efforts. So even if there is the potential to, for example, employ a user fee system, um, is the legal framework in there that the government actually allows the park to go ahead and do that? And there, there are examples where that's, that has been restricted um, or a scenario where the funds go back, and this is all too common, when, when funds go back into, say, for example, a central treasury and aren't actually return for use for environmental issues. Um, so looking down at an indigenous level, I think it's about giving at, at a local communal management level, it's about making sure that the government's frame, the governance framework gives them the flexibility and the freedom to seek out their own funding and engineer their own financial mechanisms if the government isn't already thinking of, of, of their own ways to do it. Okay, thank you, John. Um, another question, could you talk about the different marine tenure arrangements in each place and the impact that has on the viability of different financial approaches? Uh, can you describe more what, what, what's meant by marine tenure? Uh, I don't, actually, I'll, I'll, let's hold that and, and Tim, if you just want to maybe give some more information and we'll, we'll handle, tackle the question in another minute. Okay. Uh, Another question, did you apply environmental cost benefit analysis to understand the discrete circumstances of the 
MPAs and how they influence financing needs, giving MPA objectives? Um, as far as cost benefit analyses, like so, for example, investing in, you know, is there a long term economic benefit for investing in this particular MPA? That's definitely when I, I mentioned about how we're when we look at different types of information, uh, the economic valuation studies, things like that, whenever that's available for a site, we're definitely uh, looking at it. The one that, so, you know, that's, that's hugely influential to, to making the economic framework for this, which actually the presence of, of any such study or knowledge for an MPA is also an important indicator for the feasibility of certain financial mechanisms, right? Because you have to build the economic case for some of them. Um, and even to to encourage uh, the government to support an MPA, uh, but on a case by case basis, we're we're looking for if there's one available, we it's it definitely becomes a, a centerpiece of the analysis here, as well as for looking at when you start looking at income generating financial mechanisms, which ones might be feasible based on where the majority of benefits are going to, and to what types of stakeholder groups. Okay, thank you, John. Um, new question. Are funding gap analyses often performed for MPA funding initiatives and efforts? They, I, I, I would have to say on a global scale, I think there's still a major gap there. Um, there's, I think, you know, there's 17,000 marine protected areas in the world, um, particularly in developing countries. I don't think so. I, I think that the majority probably have not. Um, this is why we wanted to include, uh, for example, like a regionally managed area, because both of the ones in Colombia are, are larger national parks that have access to the, the, the national resources of a, of a middle income country. Uh, but for some of the regional areas, like the one that, that we're collecting data for in Mexico, um, it doesn't seem to be, to, they don't really seem to have that. Um, and I think that that's, that's a more pervasive issue than, than the, the you know how how frequently we have access to that in our in our case studies here might might reflect. Okay, thank you, John. Um, another comment slash question. Really interesting work. Uh, definitely not an easy task. Uh, was there any non market valuation in the financial assessment across these case studies, um, such as ecosystem services valuation? Yeah, there was. Uh, as an so ecosystem service valuation. Um, so yeah, so Columbia did a, did a, uh, ecosystem service valuation for all of their MPAs immediately preceding actually the Coraz de Profundidad. The reason why for Coraz de Profundidad, I skipped ahead to what are the, the mechanisms you might be able to engineer around the, the pressures is, is because the, there have been ecosystem evaluation surveys for that, but it's mostly been on the existence value of the MPA, which doesn't necessarily mean that you can't perhaps put a a tax that households wouldn't be willing to pay, um, a small tax to support uh, this particular MPA. But again, that, that's an example of a less marketable issue, um, of a less marketable example. But yeah, for some of them, those are available, um, but definitely not for all of them. Okay. But when we do, when we do have access to them, we, we do incorporate them into our, our overall approach and considerations. Okay, thank you, John. Um, another question, and comment. Uh, your research is very interesting and very detailed for each case study. How data and time intensive do you think your final financial uh, sustainability assessment tool will be? Is the goal for individual parks to use it or for it to be incorporated into other MPA assessment tools such as the MPA guide and the IUCN green list? As far as, as time intensiveness, I think it's it will depend on, on the information that's available. I think I think the, the most time intensive would be if, if they want to conduct their own internal evaluation, their own, uh, as far as uh, the stakeholder interviews and surveys. Um, but hopefully the idea is, is having gone through each of these to show if you have this type of data available, this type of information available, um, could it, uh, uh, if you have this type of information available, just immediately, what, what, do, you, what do you need to know? The actual calculations are, are fairly simple and they're and they're really mostly oriented towards making use of, of what information the MPA already has. So so that's a big part of trying to make this as practical and, and straightforward as possible. As far as other kind of assessment methods, yeah. So one of the one of my observations is one of my observations has been over the years that a lot, you know, the IUCN guides, um, WWF's RAPM framework, 
there's a lot of, they all include to a degree, is there financial sustainable, you know, is, do you have, is there, can funds, are funds guaranteed or reliable for, you know, say the next five years or something like that. And it's like a yes or no question. And this is designed to help inform that yes or no question and understand, is it really, is your financial strategy really sustainable? Why or why not? And how can it be improved upon? So yeah, the results are kind of meant to inform that financial sustainability question that exists in a lot of these other kind of management assessment frameworks, but don't have a great degree of, of focus on how, just exactly how to evaluate that. Okay. All right. Thank you, John. Okay. Um, back to the marine tenure question. So the, the original question was, could you talk about the different marine tenure arrangements in each place and the impact that has on the viability of different financial approaches? Um, and then with follow-up was marine tenure is who has the rights to manage profit from each area. In some okay. places, it's the federal or regional government. In others, it may be a community or indigenous group or a hybrid. Just curious whether you saw any different arrangements that affected investability. Investability. Um, yeah, so it depends on, for example, why would a marine protected area invest in, in expanding their the income from their user fee system if they're not going to see returns from that increased income, right? Where is the incentive? Um, the two examples that I think are best to compare here are like Los Sarios in Colombia and Bonaire. So Bonaire, because it's independently managed, it creates, it basically is allowed to, to keep in bank all of the, the, the profits that it gets from its user fee system, right? Uh, but for Los Sarios, the question is, you know, if they were to expand their income, the staff from, I asked them about this and they generally think that, yeah, if you produce more income for the government, they'll generally give you a more, a higher budget, but it doesn't always work that way. Um, fortunately for Colombia, at least the funds are maintained within the Ministry of the Environment. So they do go back to environmental reasons, though not environmental uh, uh, efforts, not, but though not necessarily that particular protected area. Um, that doesn't mean that any one is necessarily better than the other because, you know, you have resources like Colorado State Profundidad that aren't able to generate income and, and perhaps some of that income to the Ministry of the Environment has helped supporting that, right? Um, but generally speaking, I would think that there's, that there's greater incentive and greater assurance that uh, your financial mechanisms are gonna, are, are, there's, a greater, there's greater incentives in cases where the, the income raised from investment in these areas is still, is being kept within the local area if that helps answer the question. Okay, all right. Um, thank you, John. Uh, question and comment. Thank you very much for the presentation. Much of the presentation focused on MPAs which have local uses. Have you considered how different types of MPAs, i.e. far offshore, no use, may require different sources of funding and financial mechanisms? I'm particularly interested in how this might work for potential future MPAs in areas beyond national jurisdictions, where there would necessarily be a single government or entity managing access and enforcement of management measures. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, the categories in, in that, that cluster analysis that we use to define seven types of, of protected areas around the world, <clears throat> classify these kind of larger, tend to be offshore or have a, more, a greater offshore component, um, MPAs. Those are fewer and for, those are few in the world, even though they protect the majority of, of protected area. Um, but we look to incorporate that in Malpelo, which is 300 miles offshore from the mainland. Uh, and Corales de Profundidad also has a little bit of that component as well, and that there, there's no tourism around it. Um, in these cases, without access to certain markets, it does potentially diminish the diversity of funding mechanisms that could be used. So that could perhaps lead to more reliance on government. Um, but that's an area where I think that the, everyone's been trying to, to look at potential ways to leverage more funds from, for example, uh, the commercial fishing and mining. And not, I don't think, no, I wouldn't say mining yet, but uh, what, are, what, what are the other actors that are benefiting from management of offshore resources. Um, so if there's, if there's up to date, I think there's been greater reliance on government resources there, broadly speaking. Um, 
but it's going to be, you know, the, the, the ones in the high seat so far have, have, have relied on multilateral support. Um, there could be some potential argument there for, for um, kind of more alternative forms of carbon offsets. Um, but yeah, those are the types of areas that this is, this is the most challenging. Okay. All right. Great. And uh, I just wanted to let everyone know there are, we have a lot of really great questions we're not going to be able to get to. Um, we may be able to get to one or two more. Um, but all these questions are going to be provided to John after the webinar. Uh, so he'll be able to see them. Um, and he's provided his contact information if you want to get in touch with him. So I apologize, we're not able to get to everything, but there are just a, a lot of really good questions. Okay. Um, another one. Uh, can you talk to the advantages and disadvantages of assessing financial sustainability at the individual MPA level versus the national level? More financially sustainable MPAs can subsidize less financially sustainable ones. Yeah, the, the, the challenge there is that a number of, uh, number of mechanisms like blue bonds, death and nature swaps, potentially biodiversity offsets, a lot of these operate at, at the national level. Um, so, you know, where that applies to the site level management, if it's, you know, a, a manager could potentially try to, if it seems like a, you know, a national scale financial mechanism might work, could try to lobby support for that. Um, but yeah, that, that is one area where a lot of number of financial mechanisms aren't really oriented towards the site level. Uh, what was the second half of that, that question again? It was just a comment that if you're, you're assessing them at a national level, um, more financially sustainable MPAs can subsidize less financially sustainable yeah, ones. Yeah, that, that, that's part of it as well, is, is to, to look at where the gaps are there. Um, and that's part of the reason to, to, to look at potentially in, you know, engaging in or investing in, in alternative mechanisms that still increase funds more than perhaps that individual site necessarily needs. Um, so that's, that's one potential use for this as well, or a potential you know, consideration to have uh, when evaluating, you know, op available financial mechanisms. Okay, and John will sneak in one more question. Um, it is, in Belize, we often discuss payment for eco environmental services and biodiversity offsets, but never truly implement any of these mechanisms nationally. Can you briefly describe what the main barriers are to implementing these mechanisms? That's something that as, as we look at some, as we continue to develop these, these indicators where we're looking to assess ourselves. Um, I think a part of it has always the challenge, particularly in the marine area is kind of defining scope and level of responsibility and also on the, the, the accounting side. Um, and I would think also depending on who might be adversely affected, looking at potential political barriers there. That's about as much as I can say to that at this, at this point though. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, maybe I have time for one more. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a really good one. Um, thanks and congratulations on your research. Did you have the chance to analyze the legal instruments that create the MPAs? Are there any good examples of regulatory clauses that establish legally binding specific funding requirements for the MPAs being declared? Uh, we haven't seen, I haven't seen any evidence of legally binding uh, distributions that's, that, of legally binding uh, funding agreements outside of uh, those that, that grant. You know, so for example, um, I think where we have, or have the most knowledge of that within the case studies is probably Bonaire, uh, where the NGO has been granted uh, control over the, the finances raised. Um, in Colombia, not a whole lot, just the, uh, the, the, the agreements for the, the, the co-managed agreement for Malpelo, which again is, is, I think might be the only protected area in the country with its, within the, the national protected areas, the national parks network that had its own exclusive funding. So I haven't read the exact legal language myself there. Um, I, I think that I, I'm, I'm hope that answers the question a little bit. Um, but no, I, I haven't read, I haven't, I haven't seen any specific, the, the legal language in writing myself. Okay. More just the perspectives. It's more, it's, this is more coming from uh, perspectives of, uh, and knowledge of, of the managers and, and national representatives. Okay. All right. 
John, thank you so much. Um, this was a fantastic presentation. Lots of great questions and you will be able to see the ones we weren't able to get to. Uh, we really appreciate you coming on and we look forward to having you on in the next few years to uh, present about the development of the financial sustainability assessment tool as Thanks. it progresses. All right. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. Okay. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who was able to attend. We hope to